Okay, I'm going to want to talk to you guys today about a little principle some of you might not be aware of. Some of you have never had a design course before. Even though this is character design, there are a lot of principles inside this course that apply to other avenues of drawing. So today's lecture is basically about shape language, and it's about silhouettes. And what I just said, shape language, there's actually a whole language, derivative-based, interpretation-based language based on shape. It's actually a universal language, and believe it or not, it, it's funny because it's not something that's really practiced or talked about. Has anyone in here had other art classes besides Mike or Frank and I, and has anyone ever talked about shape language to you? No? Yeah, probably not, okay. So, um, and I don't, to me that's a huge loss because it's one of the first things I started learning once I got into uh, Marshall's classes when I was here when I was 18. It's one of the first things we talked about was visual recognition, and also the other terminology used was quick visual reads. Like, you're watching a movie and you see something come up on the screen, what's the first thing? So, what I did is I went back and I started researching and I started realizing how do we get accustomed to shapes and it starts as a child. And as a child, what happens is that you start to see, why is this not 40? You start to see basic shape recognition as a little baby. So, for example, that's going to be mom and dad that you might recognize. Okay, you might recognize other siblings, other kids. Okay, eventually you even learn to recognize basic shapes of things that are friendly and things that are bad. So, for example, if you saw that crawling on the floor, you would see your mom and dad jump up really quick. There'd be a huge reaction. You would quickly, as a youngin, associate that type of shape as being something that's not good because mom and dad got you know incredibly scared okay actually I remember an instance like that once where um, one of my kids came across this shape hold on <laughs> right there that shape was crawling on the wall and dropped by my son's crib and it was like my wife like ah, you know and went and splatted the thing right it was a spider from outside that got inside okay so what happens is that as a little kid you start looking at these little elements and you start arranging what is basically good and what's bad. And you start thinking of, you learn toys, you start, that's why when little kids, everything about them from a baby standpoint is all about really simple mass of shapes. And then the first thing that we do, we've already interpreted these shapes visually, we start association with words. So then we'll look at something and we'll point and then we'll be like ball. It's like one of the, your first words is usually ball. Or you might look at stuff and be like duck or a train you know, and he's a teddy bear, and you start learning these basic words, and then it's even the same thing down to everything that is around you. So even having a family dog, you might be able to look at that dog, and you'd be like, dog, and you know what it is. However, though, your language hasn't expanded beyond that point, so that's the early initial startup and, and base for it. You could even, you'll be outside and be like, bird. That's what you do as a little kid. You basically learn to associate language with um, all aspects, oops, hold on, sorry about that, so what will happen, for example, with this, is a little child will be outside, think of, when you guys don't realize this, because some of you aren't mom parents yet, but when you have kids, you take your kids out, you take them on walks, you're going outside, you take them to parks, you're trying to get them familiar with everything happening around them. And as little kids, when my son was little, my daughter, they start nailing off everything. They start pointing tree, this, that, bird. And then as soon as they do that, actually the parent rewards them with, oh, good, honey, good job. Yes, that's a bird. And then they do it again. And then they quickly learn to get rewarded by association of visual shapes. The, the thing is, is that this continues forward, and it's something that stays with us, and it actually progresses to a more advanced level when you get older especially if you're interested in art and design. Actually, what happens is that artists that have the creative right brain mindset actually adapt shape language better and have a better understanding of how to tell stories than somebody like my wife or one of my buddies who's completely left brain and they're much more focused. They, they can't sit and create shapes. Now, here's something I like to do. Are there any dog experts in here? Anyone who went to veterinary school? No. Yes? Okay. You were a vet tech. Okay. So you can't answer. Right? What kind of dog is that? 
Nope. It's a boxer, right? And what happens is that this is a great example of how you build up the shape language in your brain. There's no interior detail in there, is there? No. There's no eyes. There's no name tag. There's none of that. So what happens is your body, your brain starts to associate body shapes, and it associates just everything you could possibly think of with triangles and circles, and it brings all that together, and you create this little language of, of predetermined shapes, and you understand that there's a meaning that's that's connotative that's related towards that, okay? All right. Um, now, what happens is after you move out of that and you start going into some more advanced areas, okay, eventually you'll hit this phase where your parents will take you out and you'll go to like a simple zoo or you'll go to like a little petting farm, okay? And then what's one of the first things as kids that you're exposed to from your parents? Children's books. Your read books on a constant basis because they have illustrations and pictures in there, and it's a way that you build the understanding of shape language with, with children, okay? So once you get a little bit older, you're no longer calling out individual animals. You have the ability to start looking at more interesting shapes, and you can sit there and be like duck, and you can look, you can, might get a geese, you might get a calf, and you might be able to say a donkey or a mule. You can pick out the difference between donkey or a mule and a horse. Okay, you can look over here, you know that that's a bird. You might not know what kind of bird, but when you look at that bird, you might eventually be able to understand that that's a hawk or that's an eagle. What about that kind of bird there? Uh, vulture. How do you know? Uh, the way that it, is, uh, it has that weird rounded head that vultures have. Okay. Not an owl. Huh? <laughs> not an owl, it's a vulture. Okay, what about these two? Which one is... Which one's a duck? The bottom one's a duck, yeah, absolutely. And you can just tell by the weight, the way it's balanced out. This guy looks more like a, one of those egress whatever water birds with the long, and they sort of walk and stand in water, okay? All right, so basically what happens is this is where you, once you're in the age bracket between like two and three till about six, you really start making these huge improvements and associations with items that you're looking at. What about that? Exactly. Um, you'll even start to notice one thing that's fascinating to me. You might even notice in shape language the difference between types of trees. Okay. So if I were to show you that tree, any horticulture experts in here? No. Okay. If, so if I showed you that and I said, yeah, look at this oak tree. You'd be like, what? It's not an oak tree. What kind of tree is that? It's a pine tree. It's, a fir tree. it's either a Douglas fir or it's a pine tree. They look very similar, and it is. Okay. What about looking, going to the zoo? I remember when I was a kid, I'd go to the zoo all the time, and I was blown away walking around at all these little exhibits because I'd walk up and be like, wow, there's a two-humped camel. I never saw a two-humped camel, right? And then I'd look over, and there'd be, you'd see a picture of like a water buffalo. You'd see... It, you know, I remember seeing sharks, all these cool things. You're taking all this in. Your brain is a sponge for all this type of visual information. So one of the things that happens, unfortunately, who's that? Exactly. So what kind of tree is that? Right? Yeah. So, so you can start basically telling stories really quickly by uh, the collection of the shape language. Now, this is, I like this example. Here are three different pirate-based characters. Which one is more likely to be the leader? The one on the far left. That's right. Which one is the one who's likely to be sort of sneaky and drink rum and maybe steal something? <laughs> That's right. And which one's probably not too high in the level of their IQ and probably has a hard time with like simple tasks but is a big, strong brute. The middle. the middle one, right? So how do you know that if I haven't even written up a description on the characters? It's all based on the shape language. And it's based on sort of you, uh, archetypes, stereotypes that we develop in stories, things that you've already seen. And this is where all this transfers, is that all these stories you've seen, all the children's books you've read since you were a child, all this shape language that you've been exposed to, this is where it starts to come out 
And the thing is, is some of you guys don't realize you've never had to tap into this. But now this is that time where you have to tap into the back of your brain. You need to start thinking about what are the shapes for my characters and what are the visual reads going to be. So here's the, the golden connection amongst part of this, right? Is can you look at a character and tell if it is good or bad really quick? Does that look like an evil character? No. Oh, he's got a rounded tongue sticking out and he looks all happy to see you. He's happy, okay? Who are those two characters? Villain. Right, right up. The evil empire. So, so again, another association. Quick as a kid, you start learning. Think about how we brainwash kids with anthropomorphic animals walking upright. You know, mice that are like humans. Okay. All right. Um, hold on. Get that out of here. <laughs> well, you might, right? How about that? What kind? How do you know it's forest? They're, they're all clumped together. And what kind of trees would you say those are? Are they oaks? Uh, no. no. Exactly. So here, right here, by me asking you these questions, I hope you start to understand this is where all of this starts to come forward. Is that going to be in a forest? No. What kind of tree is that? Uh, palm tree. Palm tree what about specific palm tree? Could you nail it down uh, by the shape? Shoot. No, that's not queen. It's, gonna be queen. it's not queen. Very similar to queen. It's king. king. Yeah. It's more of a king palm because they have a different leaf structure that comes out like that. Okay? All right. So my, the point is, is what I'm trying to convey to you, and these are just, I'm still on the basic shapes. I haven't even got to the more complex level yet. Okay. Is that a threatening bug? No. It could be. If it's a red or one of those large black ants that bite, it could be. But that's just a real simple basic ant shape, basic exoskeleton, right? Okay, is that threatening? No. No, they are. They actually, people, a lot of cultures, a bunch of our instructors just went down to Mexico, down to uh, the pyramids to look at their art history, and you can go... I don't know. Some, there's, they're all over. They went. Four of them went, and they told me that you could buy a cup of crickets already. They're cooked. They're dried out. They're really delicious. They're actually. Yeah, they're really good. So anyway, so that's that's a cricket, and part of it's the back legs. That's how they make the little noise. Okay. So thing is, is you don't really have to be an expert on shape language right now. It's the fact that you can go through and identify. Now, does that look like something that Mickey Mouse would have on his clubhouse? <laughs> huh? No. no. Why wouldn't he have that? It's dead. Okay, does that look like something that Conan the Barbarian might have yeah. sitting on top of his head? No. Yes. As he's attacking and killing people with swords, right? Yeah. So it, that's the great thing about shape language is before we have any type of detail, we can already associate things as being good or bad. We can associate them with visual reads, archetypes, stereotypes based on the characters, uh, their background, even down to the basic art direction. And this is something that I'm really big on. And what's really sad to me is that no one, God, I'd love to just write a book on this, you know, because no one really talks about this much until you get into a higher level of art and drawing and design. Okay, so let's go over some basics. Who's that guy? That's my friend. That's right. This is why it becomes really important to us in character design. Okay? Here's a tough one. Uh, the girls can just nail it like that. There's actually a difference. Hey, wait, who's that one? That's right. Who's that one? That's my mother in law. Sorry. No, no you're right. You're right. That is, okay, but no. But look at the shape that's there, right? Look at the difference. Yeah, Donald Duck! Oh. My favorite. I love my favorite. I know. I have a huge collection. Okay, what about? Ooh, all right, here we go. Okay, now let's let's jump into here. Which one? Easy. Unicorn. Okay, who's that? Ariel. Oh, my God. I was, like, struggling. I'm like, who's the one in that? I know the girls would get it in a second, right? Also Ariel. How do you know it's not another one? 
Ariel in her other form. Yeah, in her mermaid form. Okay. Uh, basic wizard could be Gibson. Or old witch, right? Yeah. Okay. Some of these are older. Old Disney Castle. Castle. Used to be in the center of the park. Mm -hmm. Who's that? We know who that is. Because he's a big, giant, yeah. What about that guy? Yeah. No. Or it's really no, Pinocchio. Like Pinocchio. He doesn't have a ball on his head. Okay. So yeah, let's go to another. <laughs> yeah. Who are those people? <laughs> How do you know there's no detail on it? It's all about shape. So here's my thing when I start talking to students. That's right, it's Belle. Goofy. Goofy. Look at the shapes. Big. Look, huh? Okay. Shh. One at a time. It's like an ADHD convention gone by. You know what I mean? All right. So, who's that? Who's that? Yeah. What about here? We know Bart, right? SpongeBob. Bart's mom. What about there? Okay. What about right here? Okay, what about that? Big Okay, excellent. So, here, here's one of my... Here's one of my grand points about what the project you're about to get into. Is before you start getting into interior detail, you should be working off a whole bunch of silhouettes and you should be sketching rough shapes that we did before in the first assignment and you should be blocking those out and you should be thinking about visual reads and the shape context okay you could just sit and do a basic turtle and you could do a basic you know the basic three characters you can do more right however though you can stretch the assignment further if you start thinking about is your turtle a good guy or a bad guy okay and then if you go into the shape language and you start thinking about what the visual read is on the shape first that means you're going to be 10 times more successful in the beginning because you're paying attention to that. I just happened to come across this, and I'm like, man, that's so cool because look at all the shape variations from the Toy Story project, right? So one of the things that makes you really successful as a designer, and it doesn't matter to me, this is the golden thing about animation, is that I could line up every one of these characters right here, which have pretty much set, set the standard for animation over the past 20 to 30 years, right? And you can identify every single character on that page, right? I know you guys could. Yeah. Okay, most of you could. Um, there might be a couple hard ones, like does anyone know who that is? That's right. It takes a minute, because what happens when you look is your brain has to go, flips through its microprocessor, and then you're like, boom, boom, and you remember the shape, and then you can bring back the name on it. What about that guy? We don't see him too much. Casper is flying in the air, right? Okay. What about we know who that is? What about that one? That's more my mighty mouse. Mighty mouse, right? Exactly. So, one of the things I like to talk about is if you want, if you want to be a creator, you want to be a really good character artist, and it doesn't matter if you want to do games or animation. It all comes down to this. It's all about visual reads. It's about quick identification. There's no detail on any of these, and you guys can instantly identify you know who's on the page okay let me uh from here i want to jump up and i want to show you a little of what happens when you get to more of an advanced level in this type of designing okay this is an artist whose name is ben morrow he went to art center he got out he actually does much more realistic stuff now but this is stuff he was doing when he first got out he was doing this for sony pictures animation look at the visual reads of the silhouettes up above and then down below you see the detail that's presented in there of the characters okay so this isn't an advanced level where now you're drawing and designing not only are you drawing the character you're posing them into a particular pose that sets and defines their attributes whether or not they're a fighter whether or not they're a warrior maybe they're a thinker maybe they're you know an intellectual you know and so having them with different weapons uh, different props the props start to tell also part of the part of the story. No, you don't have to do any props associated with this first assignment. Later on, we will do some props in there. Okay, but I like to show this because it's a great example of what happens at a more advanced level. Okay, same thing with this. All right, 
Look at that. Look at those guys. God, you guys need to spend more time studying history. No. Right? <laughs> you know, so every one of you in here, I mean, I thought this was a great just lineup. Just look at the differences right there. And what's funny is that if any of you guys have ever seen a movie before, and there's like a, you know, there's a good guy and a bad guy, a protagonist and antagonist fighting each other, and then you can't tell who dies. Yes. And you're like, and you can't tell who just went. That's a great example of bad art direction where they didn't think about the shapes of the characters, and then that way the audience gets really confused. Uh, you don't want to confuse your audience, right? So again, back to the, sort of the, the basic principles of thinking about silhouettes and overall designs. Let me see what else I had in here. That's a page which is, this is from the Skillful Huntsman. This is a project that was done with Art Center students back in the day where they had to basically, it's really common, a lot of schools is you take a story that already existed, you change the name on it, you redefine the characters in another time period. Okay, so you can take like, you know, um, any classic story and you just revamp it, redo it in another time period and you come up with something really cool, okay? This was a great little book and what was really cool about this is the students at Art Center where they're being forced to have to think about all of the different variations of the characters and especially their weapons, how they wield their weapons and how they use them in a basic pose. And that right there is a huge sort of leap and establishment. Now Art Center isn't the only school that does this. Part of Art Center and a lot of their thinking actually comes from a couple of schools that specialize in product design that are over in Europe. Okay, so this has been existed in the film industry because way back in the day, you can go look at Alfred Hitchcock. Alfred Hitchcock would sit and he would sketch out character shapes and then he would do his own storyboards and he would indicate what's happening inside his stories with contrast in black and white. Then he would go film those sequences based off of his understanding of setting up scenes and his understanding of the shape language, okay? All right, so um, I think those are just wonderful examples to look at. I love talking about this stuff. Um, and then let me jump over here. And this is where it all starts to come together. This is why we were working on basic shapes in the beginning of class. I was trying to get you guys to think about rounds and squares and circles all put together and what you might come up with. So um, in part of your sketching, what I would recommend, I have students that want to do pure black silhouettes, you can. What I like to do is I like to sketch my shapes like this and I put like an 80% dark gray underneath. That way I can still see the core silhouette and the visual read of the character. But then I could come back into it and I don't really have any linear detail on there right now. The only thing that's on there right now is construction. So construction is key for making your character feel real, making sure that there's visual weight attached to them that they feel anchored to the ground, all right? That's all part of the basics of form of construction, but you do not have to go in right now. What I want you to do is sit and just have fun sketching rough shapes like this and putting an 80% tone of gray underneath. I used to do all black, but the problem with all black is, is it limits part of the construction of the character. By having something set up like this, it makes it a lot easier for your minds to sort of see. And that's a great example right there. You see how they're rough, sketches of the characters, but looking at them, if I go really small, actually won't let me go small, but um, you can already see the visual read of the body shapes, right? So you get an idea of what the personality is. One of the things that's really, really important for you to do is you start creating body shapes and looking at people and drawing and creating different um, variations of shapes is for you to talk to somebody that's next to you or someone you know and maybe show them one of your turtles or show them one of the birds that you sketch and ask them, what's your first impact off of this? And their first visual read, they should be able to tell you whether it's good or bad. You should be searching for that now, okay? Because if you don't, if you give me, if you draw a turtle and you tell me your turtle is supposed to be friendly and kind, but he has a bunch of triangles inside part of his shape construction, there's gonna be a massive problem with the visual reads and how I'm interpreting what that character is supposed to be. Okay, so, you know, part one of all this, by the way, this is something I like to do. Who are those three guys? Crackle Pop, right? Okay. 
What are the name of the four presidents on that? Uh, Washington, <laughs> Jefferson, Roosevelt. <laughs> 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 such a good example of how we're such a shape conscious society with advertising. And when it comes to history, we fall apart. Okay. And we don't even know like the four basic They're presidents. Yeah. Roosevelt yeah. in the back. That's Lincoln, Washington. This is? That's right. Yeah, I got him but we can identify we can identify these three guys in a heartbeat, right? And part of that is because of the commercial and the way we grow up in our society. We have so much advertising that comes about. So I just like to show that real quick. And by the way, everything we talked about today relates 100% to building environments and storyboarding. So it's not just character design. Look at the difference in these trees right here. Okay, the fact that there are different types of trees. There are different types of environments, different types of rocks. All of this information comes back 100%. In fact, you can start staging scenes based off of simple silhouette shapes. Okay, So this is taking what we're doing in character design and pushing it even further to an environment level, and it's the same principles. Nothing stops. Okay. Um, this is what I wanted to show you. This is an approach to some simplistic placement with environment design. Some of this is a little kit bash too, okay? But you get a quick read of the location. So this is how we establish mood inside environments. Once we do this in Photoshop, it's a certain way of painting, of filling in shapes, having one visual read, one area of detail, but it's relative to silhouette and shape design. After you take your core idea there in your design, your finished outcome is now going to be a piece like that. Okay, you see where it starts? It starts with little thumbnails and designs, and then it goes in here. The only difference is, is when you get to this level of designing, you're also thinking about placement of horizon line, being high or low or medium. You're thinking about what's happening in the scene. Is it a one-point shot? Is it a two-point shot? Because in perspective, there are different times that we use different vanishing points because they convey different types of feelings, okay? But all of this is based off of the basic principle. So if you can understand a principle, and by the way, my environment class is doing this right now. We're working on principles of taking really base silhouettes of structures and then developing those into a one-point perspective drawing, okay? And you can take simple trees. Look at what happens when you overlap trees of just basic silhouette shape, and you put an animal in there. You start to tell a story, right? It's one of these great, wonderful things that just move itself forward, and you can really become a pretty efficient storyteller just by using really simple, based red visual shapes. That's all you really have to do. In fact, I have a giant shape library in Photoshop that I hand out to students, okay? And you could use it, and I can actually, there's a way in Photoshop outside of linear thinking that I could create compositions within just a couple minutes because I have a giant collection of trees and buildings and fortresses and castles and I just go stretch the shape out as a vector based shape in Photoshop and I create the environment in a matter of a couple minutes. Okay? All right. And then, you know, God, I just love looking at this stuff because there's so much, you know, what is that? Look at that quick study. What does that tell you? Yeah. Look at the angles in there. This is when you get composition, you get feeling, you start using angles, you have a character with some type of a long spear, you have some weird looking creature that looks like a snake with wings, like a, and a hawk who's flying up and looks like they're about to engage, right? And then this, just the shapes and the visual reads are there, but then it transfers past this. I want to tell you guys a quick story because when I was working, going to college, one of the guys I was working with was a psychology major. And he was getting his master's degree and he asked if he could do a study on me because he was trying to do his master's degree on vis uh, people with adaptive right brains that are better at visual reads and telling stories on a creative side. One of the tests he gave me is he gave me 20 flashcards like this and they had a series of a, a storytelling and he gave it to me all mixed up and said go. And, I, and I, my job was to organize Look at all the cards. I laid them out first, and then being a right brain creative, I was able to just go 
oh, that's the beginning, that's middle, this is the end, that's the battle, that's the fight, here we are, the end of the sequence. And I laid him out, I did it in about 33 seconds, and he told me he's been giving this test to people um, for his graduate paper, and he said everybody usually averages a minute and a half to two minutes to get it done. Mm -hmm. So the only difference is, is he'd never given it to somebody who was an artist who is a right brain adaptive individual. So us being creative types, we already have this ability to tell stories and to think about visual shape language. We just need to stop and prevent ourselves from going into detail. And that right there is one of the defining factors that separates ourselves in a beginning point from a higher level of advanced designers, okay? This is Iwo Takamoto, right? Who worked for Hanna-Barbera. All right, those are all his designs. That's, look at the visual shapes and the reads there for those characters. By the way, this property still exists. It's still being made by Warner Brothers, and it's still being bought and sold in DVD, and it's still a TV show. That's huge. You're talking about a property that aired in the middle of the 70s. It's almost 40 to 50 years old, and it's still running, right? That's a success in shape language, okay? Um, Creature box. I was just having this discussion with a student the other day. They're like, all I want to do is guys in battle gear with swords. And I'm like, go look at creature box. Those two designers in Insomniac Games, they're, they're leading and revolutionizing the way the games are made because they're coming up with these beautiful designs and they fully understand shape language. They bring it into all of their drawings and their sketches. Even, even if they do something realistic, you're ending up with an outcome like this. So that's why I call this little folder right here of outcome. You know, because this is what happens when you get really good with good solid foundational shape language. You have this ability to draw and create magnificent characters that can go on and lead a whole life of their own. In fact, those of you in this class being exposed to this and understanding this, if you apply this to storyboarding, you apply it to environments, you do it with characters, you apply it to children's books, you apply it to 3D modeling, you're going to be out above your competition and you're going to be beating them, but you have to be able to stop and go back and think about how to push your shapes. So as you start sketching, what I don't want to see, because I always have someone do this, they start sketching and they come up and they're like, I did my turtle, here's my turtle. And it's this fully rendered turtle. And I'm like, no, we're not doing any rendering right now. Your job is to be playing with shapes, squashing and stretching and pulling. What's going to happen when you start producing shapes and silhouette studies, your first page usually sucks because your brain is just getting used to that. Now, I have some students in here that I've had in other classes. Kevin, would you not agree mm -hmm. that your first page of shapes, whether in houses or environments or characters, they usually they suck, right? But once you get into your second page and your third page, you start coming up with new ideas. Why? Because it's the way our brains work. Your brain will start to question and go, everything I'm doing looks like everything else that I'm doing. So then you have to realize how do you change that? You change that by squashing and stretching and pulling the shapes and creating something that's different that's more appealing. You create that by having opposites and contrast by having straight edge against curves. You create that by having large rounds against squares, uh, you know, having large, medium, and small in shapes and circles. You start applying some of these basic terms that deal with contrast, and you end up with a better looking visual read. Then you take that shape, and what we're gonna do is then we're gonna draw on top of it and put linear detail on it. And here's the great thing about having a shape. If I have a shape of an owl or a turtle, I can just draw over that shape 20 times and make 20 different characters because all I'm doing is I'm changing the interior lines of the detail. That's the easy part. Unfortunately, most of you in this classroom have been trained from an early starting point in your life to be tracers, where you look at objects and you trace and copy. That's my problem with basic drawing classes when they put you in front of a still life and they just have you sit there and you trace and copy the damn still life the whole time. No one's teaching you how to draw it from your imagination. And that's what this class is all about. So to do that, we start with shapes. We do a bunch of studies. We go through. We might do a page of 11 by 17 
and only have three. If you have three shapes that look cool, it's been a successful day. You take those three shapes that you like, you then put them on another page and you develop them and you go a little bit further with those and you see where that takes you. The more time you put on your shape studies, the better you get. When I have students that bomb this project, you know why they bomb it? Because they do one or two shape studies and they go right into the, the finished character. And they don't pursue it. They don't do a page of silhouettes of exploration. Okay, This is process. In fact, in last night's portfolio class, I was talking to the class about this is what's really important. Mike was our guest speaker too. And we we're talking about what people want to see in your portfolios. They don't want to see finished drawings and renderings all the time. They want to see your ability to demonstrate process and to design. This is designing 101. Rough sketches, silhouette shapes, exploration, finding your pathway to success. Because success, good designs, and what Creature Box is doing, they just don't sit down and do one sketch. They do a couple sketches, they do pages of them, they figure out, and here's the thing that most of you don't realize. How many of you look up on like concept art, concept ships, or you're looking in an art of book, and you see the art, right? All you're seeing is the finished work. They usually don't show you the process work, the rough sketches, and all the pages that the artists do to get there. And that is what separates a good designer from a crappy designer, okay? Any questions? God, I could just go through all of this. I mean, look at how cool that is, right? That's their take on uh, uh, He-Man. They do that all the time. But they do their version of something. Look at those. Look at the biceps. Look at that body, and then look at Skeletor. It's all skinny and all, you know. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, right? I mean, that's what I love about looking at guy, the Creature Box artists, and I love looking at just some of the old, you know, Iwo Takamoto designs, and some of these also were Phil Mendez. Phil Mendez is a gentleman that I worked with before. He was my boss, who was trained at Disney, and he also worked for. Uh, Anna Barbera as well and designed a lot of characters. Okay? I mean, this is like good old simple classical foundational drawing coming out. This is why you're in your sketchbook. This is why you should be drawing miles every week, right? Is this is where it starts. You don't need to produce work at at a level of creature box right now. That's not what's required of you. What's required of you is you have an understanding of shape and variation and you just don't take the first idea that pops in your head. That's usually the wrong idea. You keep working along and then you get to this idea. Or what happens to me, I'll be doing pages and pages of silhouettes and then I take a break and right when I'm going to bed, boom, the idea pops in my head. So that's why I keep a little pile of post-its next to my nightstand and that's why I'm always sticking post-its with ideas onto my wallet and I have it in my bag and I put them then into my sketchbook because then I translate those ideas, which for me, solving a problem, and I bring that into my designing. Okay? Any questions? Cool. Let me stop the recorder real quick.